screen. Cool. All right. So insider tips for winning your first round of venture capital. Um, and it's Simpsons themed because I like the Simpsons and I'm going to try to keep this as interesting as possible. So you're here today because you are something like Lisa Simpson. You are optimistic and excited and you believe that you can change the world in some way. You're also here because you're interested in venture capital. Um, hopefully you have some basic knowledge of high growth startups already. Um, really the reason that you want to raise venture capital, there's really only one reason, which is you believe that you have the ability to create a scalable business, which means you're going to grow really quickly and venture capital is going to help you do that faster and better. Okay. So real quick, um, there are basically a bunch of stages of growth and there are no hard and fast rules of uh, when you can raise venture capital. There's a lot of companies that raise with just an idea, right? And Quibi is one of those companies. They raised a billion dollars with this idea that they're gonna revolutionize how kids, how the young folks watch videos uh, over the internet. And so they raised a billion dollars pre anything, pre MVP. Um, it did not work out very well. And that's a real testament to this idea that um, more money doesn't actually help you get what you want. Your goal as an entrepreneur is to get to product market fit. And ideally you also have founder product fit. You care about the problem that you are trying to solve and you believe that uh, other people care about the solution that you can present to them. So um, we can, again, we can kind of do an AM at the end. So I'm going to try to go through quickly since I know we're getting a little started a little bit late. So real quick on me, I'm a repeat co-founder. Noble is my third uh, company that I've started. Um, I've raised over $12 million from top firms like Andreessen Horowitz, Initialized Capital, First Round Capital, SV Angel, Upfront, M Mucker, um, all really great venture capital firms, highly respected, and, and I've been really fortunate to work with some great venture partners. Um, my parents immigrated from the U.S. a couple of years before I was born, so I'm first generation USA, and part of the reason why I like The Simpsons is I was basically raised by them. I grew up watching uh, TV a lot, um, and so I, I hope that some of you are Simpsons fans too, um, and we'll get some of the references that, that I've included in this presentation. Um, my new company is called Knowable. We've been around for about a year, and um, our mission is to empower enthusiastic teachers to inspire daily learning and action. So. I am really enthusiastic about what I've learned about raising venture capital. I want to share that knowledge with you guys. Um, this is a dry run. Um, so again, I'll be looking to you for, for questions. What did I miss, et cetera. Um, but my hope is, is that um, this goes way beyond what you're going to find in a Google search, right? And that there's some real insider tips that, that somebody who's been through the process can share with you. Okay, so um, let's take a minute and visualize the end that you want, right? So. Uh, You've all been vaccinated. All the VCs have been vaccinated. Uh, they want to go back to in-person meetings and you get called in by a partner that you're working with at a top VC firm to come into the boardroom uh, and present your presentation, right? And you're going to pitch your big idea. So you walk into the room, you put your laptop in, you kind of hope that the cable syncs properly and your presentation that you've worked you know, so, so hard and long on uh, appears on this big screen behind you. And quick insider tip, you always want to sit closest to the screen so that when you are presenting, uh, people don't have to turn their neck to like see you talk and then the deck, right? You, they want to be, you, you want their eyes on you and your presentation in the back. Um, obviously with COVID, everyone is pitching online. So we can talk more about how to pitch um, effectively via the internet. Um, but let's just assume right now, you know, in six months from now, and you're, you're getting called into Silicon Valley, uh, you know, a top office and you see a room that looks like this, but weirdly somehow even maybe less diverse. Um, so the most important thing I want you to visualize is that you are walking in this room with founder product fit and product market fit. That's ideal. Like that makes everything so much easier. And what I mean by founder product fit is you are working on a problem that you're super passionate about solving and that you feel kind of uniquely qualified to solve. And what I mean by product market fit is You've built a solution and maybe it's a really rough version of that solution, but other people are already telling you, hey, this early version of your product, I love it and I'm telling other people about it. That's the best sign of product market fit. When somebody uses your product and they tell other friends unsolicited to use your product too. Okay, so you're, you're in this conference room and you deliver your pitch, you talk for 20 minutes, it's amazing. Like you just nail it and you can tell that everyone is so excited to invest in you because they know hey, you just built a rocket ship and they want a seat on your rocket ship and they want to help you however they can. And so within an hour, the partner who you're closest with, you know, texts you and says, hey, um, Lisa, great job. That was an amazing pitch. You know, my partners loved you just the way I thought they would. Um, here's our terms for, for, you know, your first round of VC. Okay. So everyone did that visualization exercise. Hopefully 
look, that's really the hardest part of raising venture capital. That's it. You just did the hard part. I'm just kidding. You have to get ready for a really long road. Um, that is, that doesn't happen easily. It's usually the product of a lot of hard work and a lot of prep. You're going to get a bunch of annoying and conflicting advice, like from me, insider tips for winning your venture capital, right? Um, there's going to be so many thought leaders on Twitter who are telling you to do things one way or another way. Um, and you have to filter through a lot of noise. You're going to go through numerous versions of your deck. This is a thing that is very subjective, right? So everyone is going to have an opinion on what your deck should be. Um, you're going to have to have a lot of meetings before you get called in to have a partner meeting. Uh, you're going to have to get to know each, you know, the partner who's kind of sponsoring you at the venture firm. And you have an obligation to maintain a sense of optimism throughout this process. Um, if you're successful, you're going to bear the burden of returning your investors money. So really, if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, it's that raising venture capital is not an end in itself. It's merely a means to help you get to product market fit and to build a scalable business. Um, okay, so visualizing is important, but Again, you wanna visualize the right things. Visualize having a product that works and that customers love. Don't just visualize getting more venture money that doesn't lead to success or happiness. Okay, so product market fit, most important, but it's not all. There are things that you can do that are gonna increase your chances of getting a great partner from a VC firm or um, getting the great terms for yourself too, which are also really important. So how you pitch, how you present, how you go through the process is really important. And that's what I want to focus on in this presentation, right? You're here because you're interested in raising venture capital. You want to learn more. And, and I think that there are things that you can do on the margin beyond just having a great product or team um, that, that can really help you. So here, you know, I tweeted out some of these quick hot tips for raising your, your first seed round. Paul Graham replied, he's the founder of Y Combinator and is really the OG of, of Silicon Valley thinking. And, you know, he, he really reinforces this idea of like, yes, that's all great, but the best thing you can do, have an amazing product, understand your users really well, become ramen profitable, which means it's sort of another way of saying, don't need venture capital. That's the best time to raise um, and spend more time talking to users and investors. So I agree with Paul, but it's not all, right? There are still things that you're gonna have to do if you decide to raise venture capital and, uh, and I wanna help you. So why even raise at all? If you're doing all those things, why raise? Well, high growth startups, you're gonna need cash to fuel growth. Some of the most successful and profitable companies today, they lost money for a really long time. Right, Facebook, Pinterest, uh, Snapchat, et cetera. These, are, these companies are worth billions of dollars and in some case, hundreds of billions of dollars, but they needed venture capital to get started. And, and you know, theoretically, you're going after venture capital for that same reason. Um, look, cash is a competitive advantage. If you have more money, you can learn faster. So venture capital can help you speed up the rate at which you are learning and hopefully getting to product market fit even faster. Um, and the reality is too, if you raise money, you're going to be able to pay yourself a salary before the business can pay you a salary. You're not going to be able to pay yourself a lot of money. Um, founders uh, underpay themselves relative to market. I, I pay myself way less than I made when I came out of college. Um, and then look, some investors, they're really value add. They've got deep networks, they've got experience. So the right partner can really be a mentor to you and can help your business grow in the right way. Um, not all investors are value add and some, some will say that. Um, and, uh, and so you have to kind of filter through, through um, each person. We can talk more about that later. Um, also, if you have raised money from a prestigious firm, you're going to just get more credibility from the press. You're going to get more credibility from employees too, right? So if, if part of your uh, business requires you hiring the very best, then people are going to want to know that you've gotten some validation. So the stamp of approval of a venture capitalist can help. All right. So I'm going to talk in this section about... Um, what to do before you pitch, and then we'll talk about the actual pitch process. And I, again, want to encourage you all to just leave questions in the comments and we'll, we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> okay, first thing I want you to know, VC is really unfair. Um, most of the money is concentrated in California, New York, and Massachusetts. Maybe this is changing with COVID, but the reality is, is that there are certain hubs where people are located who have the capital. Um, if you're black, if you're female, the odds are against you right now. And VCs will admit that they are pattern matchers, right? So they're gonna look at Facebook and they're gonna see a white guy who led that from Harvard. They're gonna look at Microsoft and see a white guy from Harvard who led that. They're gonna look at um, you know, uh, Snapchat and see a white guy from Stanford who started that. So they're, they're looking at what's worked in the past and, and, and you know, whether they're uh, conscious or unconsciously biased, that bias is there. Um, you know, a lot of white founders have driven 
a lot of returns for VCs. And so it's harder for females and, and uh, minorities to break in today. Uh, I think that's changing, hopefully. Um, but I think, you know, the reality is, is that my experience is not going to be the same experience as yours. I'm a, I'm a white dude who graduated from Harvard, right? So I'm sharing this information of my experience so that you can also get a sense of what it is like, uh, you know, how your experience might be different. Okay. <clears throat> no matter who you are, what you look like, uh, it, VCs have a pretty common goal, and that's that they want to return as much money to their investors, which are called LPs, as possible. And there's a term in venture capital, which you've probably heard, um, which is a unicorn. And a unicorn is basically a cute way of saying a company that's worth, worth more than a billion dollars. Um, different funds will have different goals of sort of their threshold of how big a company needs to be for it to be a good investment. But quick rule of thumb is if you don't have a plan to be a billion dollar company, then venture capital probably isn't right for you. Um, the smaller the fund, the less the less big your company needs to be for it to be successful for the VC. But if you're going to talk to, with a mega fund, you have to understand that they want you to be a unicorn or a decacorn or more, right? A decacorn is a company that's worth $10 billion more. All right, so when you are a founder, what you have is equity, right? You start a company today, you've got 100% of that business. And I want you to understand that when you go and you fundraise, what you're actually doing is you're selling equity. You're irrevocably selling equity to someone else. And uh, that process is, I think, you know, it's, it's called fundraising, but I think that's kind of a misnomer that favors investors. What you're really doing is you're selling ownership in your business. And this is something that if you have uh, founder market fit, you're gonna be spending a long time and a lot of sweat and equity, you know, personal equity going into this business. So you wanna be really thoughtful, thoughtful of who, you're, who you sell your equity to. Um, so because investors are looking to return their fund so that they can make money for their investors, their LPs, um, they really want you to go all out, right? They want you to build the next Facebook or the next Pinterest or, um, you know, the next, uh, Peloton or whatever it is. So a $20 million exit, if you own 50% of the company, that, that might be a really good life-changing outcome for you. Um, but it's not necessarily good for the VCs. I'm going to pause real quick. Sorry, guys, and just check to see if there are people in the waiting room um, who I can let in. Can you guys do like a plus or minus if you think I should go slower or faster? Plus if I should go faster or slower or just a thumbs up if you guys are tracking. <clears throat> All good, all good, thumbs up, tracking. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so you guys can see my, my screen still, so I'm gonna go back to present mode. Um, thanks everyone for replying. All right, so we talked about know your customer. Um, they want you to build a big business. So if you go in and you say like, hey, my big pitch is we're gonna get bought for $20 million in three years, that's a bad, that's, a, that's an immediate no. Right, like just don't say that. That's not what you're. That's not what you're setting out to do if you're raising venture capital. Venture capital is specialty financing, and and look, here's the big reality: six percent of the deals drive sixty percent of the returns for venture. Um, can you guys see uh, my chat screen? Is that in your way? One sec. All right. So 6% of the deals drive 60% of the turns. So, so a startup, inv uh, a VC investor, they're going to want to know that, oh no. Oh, you guys, my screen froze. This is so frustrating. I can see the guy in the red shirt wearing Detroit Red Wings. Can you nod if you still see my, you see, yeah, okay. All right, guys. So unfortunately, my computer has frozen and I only have the presentation on this computer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to end up recording this myself and then sending it to everyone who registered and I will answer your questions as part of that recording. So I think what you guys should do right now is, um, if you have a question that you want me to answer, please email me. My email address is warren at knowable.fyi. 
and I will try to answer your question as part of that presentation that then gets emailed back out. That sound good? Can somebody write my email address in the chat because my computer is frozen? Uh, Warren at knowable.fyi. Really sorry for this. All right, I'm gonna have to turn off my computer and end this presentation short, but shortly, but I will email everyone who registered for the event um, since I do have your email addresses and, uh, and hopefully can answer questions live too, if that would be helpful to, to people. Um, thank you for joining. I feel very embarrassed that this didn't work as hoped, but I am looking forward to sharing this with you all and hope that you have a good MLK day and Monday and uh, look forward to hearing from you. Bye. Okay, please share a deck. I see that, Elliot. Thanks. I will consider sharing the deck. Um, uh, all right, I looks like I'm back. My computer unfroze, so I'm just gonna keep going through it. And if you guys want to stick around, please do. Um, let me see some quick questions too here. If there's anything that I think I might not be able to. Yeah, I'm gonna answer Drew's question about best time of years to raise. Can I, can I explain what I mean by the $20 million exit? Also, what would I consider fair for equity to capital raised? How much equity should I give up per dollar amount? Okay, so what I mean by the $20 million exit is if you raise money from a VC firm and they're investing at your, your company at a valuation of $10 million for a 20% stake, right? So they're getting $2 million into your, they're giving you 2 million bucks. Um, your pre-money valuation is $8 million and now your company is worth $10 million. Um, then, uh, you will, they'll effectively own 20% of your business. So if you then go, go turn around and sell your business for 20 million bucks, um, their, their $2 million got turned into, um, they own 20% of that. So they're, they're gonna get uh, close to 4 million bucks. The, the math is a little bit complicated because they get preferred. But the point is, is that they're not getting a huge multiple on their money. And what they want, because VC is risky, they want businesses that yield, um, uh, kind of like more than 2x, especially if there's, there's a long time frame. All right, I'm gonna to try to share my screen one more time. If it doesn't work, again, I'll just I'll get send everyone the recording and uh, probably the, the deck too. Okay, so 6% of deals. All right, so tip number three, the best thing you can do to raise venture capital is have really good fundamentals as a business, right? So your, your goal is product market fit. The best time to raise is when you don't need to. And you're going to use this even when you do need to raise this kind of psychology, right? Um, a lot of people compare venture capital raising to dating. If you seem really desperate, um, people don't want to date you, right? So sometimes it's just like having that psychology of I don't need to find a person right now is usually the, the time when you're most attractive to, to a mate and similarly with venture capital. Okay, so I mentioned up top that investors are looking to de-risk. Um, and what does that mean? They're looking for a big enough market. That means because they're unicorn hunters, they, want, they believe that a company in your space can be worth a billion dollars or more. They're looking for a team that they believe can execute on that. They're looking for signs that you already have a product that is scalable 
And if you have traction too, even better, right? Uh, that's gonna increase your chances. So really your deck is only a fraction of your pitch. Um, and, and my friend, Jason Ye, who has a company called Adam Adventures, he put together this you know, quick chart, but basically glacier metaphor, right? Is your pitch deck is just the tip of the glacier. Um, it's just a lot of people spend all their time thinking about their pitch deck, but really your pitch is so much more than the presentation itself. Okay. Here's the reality. Unicorns are hard to spot, right? No one knows for sure what's going to be the next Facebook or the next Snapchat or the next Pinterest. So, um, and, and not a lot of companies who raise, who raise their first round of capital have meaningful traction. A lot of them don't have product market fit before they go out to raise. So a lot of investors for this reason, they famously pass on companies like Airbnb and Uber. Um, and they're, they're kind of trying to find that company that has the potential to be a unicorn. So your job as a founder, when you're selling equity in your business is to convince someone that you have a high likelihood of becoming a unicorn, especially relative to anyone else who's pitching that week, that month, that year. So um, this, this presentation will hopefully help you do that a little bit better. All right. I think the second most important piece of advice, if you're going to take anything away from this presentation, is build your network as soon as possible. And when I say your network, I don't mean network with other investors. I mean network with other founders. So founders are really the gatekeepers for for great introductions to venture capitalists. They're also the people who are most likely to help you on your journey as an entrepreneur and help you find the true thing that you're after, which is product market fit. Um, and, uh, you know, founders also, um, they're gonna be able to tell you exactly which partner you should talk with, which one you might wanna stay away from, which one is just gonna not a right fit for you, et cetera. So how do you, when you think about networking, think first about networking with other founders. And ideally, if you want to raise venture capital, find founders who have raised venture capital before because they're the ones that venture capitalists will listen to the most. It's better to get an introduction from a founder who's been funded and successful than it is to get an introduction from another investor. If an investor is introducing you to another investor, that's usually weird. That's a weird signal because investors in many ways are competitive, right? So if I'm an investor and I'm like, mm, I'm not going to invest in your company, but ooh, you should talk to this investor, uh, not, not the best signal. But if you get introduced by a founder who says, hey, Lisa is amazing. And Lisa, I, I'm sure like, if I had the money, I would invest in her company because I believe that she's building a rocket ship. That's the intro you want. So start this today. Like the best time to build your network is 20 years ago. Uh, the next best time, 19 years ago. And third best time today. So find ways to, to become friends with other founders. Okay, how do you become friends with other founders? The best way to be a friend with a founder is to actually be a good friend. Um, and you do that by giving first, seeing how you can help. Twitter is an amazing resource for networking, right? You can go and you can find a company that you like and respect and at mention the founder and really just say like, hey, you know, love what you're building, like be genuine and supportive. Um, founders are not immune from, from compliments. So that's a good way to ingratiate yourself uh, and, um, build some rapport. Um, you don't have to be transactional about it, right? Like I think the real goal here is to is to make friends. And this isn't valuable just for venture capital. It's valuable for life, but also it's valuable for your business, right? Because a founder, if you're a founder, you're going to go through highs and lows, and you're going to want to talk with other people who have been there before. So um, I I made my network of founders. I built my network by joining an accelerator in LA. That accelerator was called Mucker Lab. Some of my best friends have come out of that program. Um, that's where I found like my Sherpas, my mentors, et cetera. And some of, you know, so much of the learning that I'm sharing today is because I went through that accelerator. An accelerator is basically like a grad school program for first time founders. So I'm a big proponent, I, I recommend it, but you can certainly skip accelerators. Um, you know, there's no hard and fast rule. Okay, um, so you can network even if you don't have a network. So I guess the dollar sign here is investors, the star is you. Don't worry about networking with investors first. Again, worry about networking with founders, especially founders who have gotten investments. Um, but also just be friends with other founders who haven't gotten investments because uh, the best way to make friends, to be friends with famous people is be friends with them before they were famous, right? Like find the people who you believe in and start investing your social capital in them. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna go through this real quick because I know we're running late. So um, it helps to have a startup lawyer. You don't, this is not the first thing you need to do. The, the most important thing you need to do for your business is find product market fit. There are many ways to get legal stuff done really quickly. I think Stripe Atlas and, and YC have great um, standard docs. Um, if you're sure that you want to raise venture capital, then you'll just want to be a C Corp in Delaware. If you're not sure, then it becomes more complicated. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not a lawyer. 
um, don't quote me on legal advice, but number one thing I will tell you is don't hire your mom's friend's divorce attorney, right? There's like a lot of lawyers out there who are like, oh yeah, I do startups, I can, I can help you. Um, don't talk to those lawyers. Uh, they're, they're gonna waste your time. Um, they're gonna charge you fees, et cetera. There are some firms in Silicon Valley which specialize in startups and the really good ones, if they believe in you, if they believe that you have the potential to raise venture financing, they're gonna waive all of their fees. So I wanna reiterate that point. If you are a startup founder and you actually have the potential to be a VC backable business, you should be able to find a firm which can help you um, without charging you anything up front because they know that they're gonna make a lot of money from you in fees when you do your financing. <clears throat> okay, so um, don't take intros from lawyers. Um, this is like another thing where like lawyers will be like, oh, I can introduce some investors. They're usually not as credible. If you want to get the best intro, the best intros come from other founders. All right, <clears throat> I talked about capitalization and equity. Right? So when you birth your company, you have 100% of the equity, right? You form your C-Corp in Delaware. Um, if you're a solo founder, you have 100%. If you're a joint founder and you split the equity 50-50, you have 50% of the shares in your Delaware corporation. Um, every time you issue shares, that, that is irrevocable, right? So you give shares to somebody, they're on your cap table. So you might early, in the early days, as you're a newbie founder, you, you'll meet your you know, neighbor's friend who's a startup pro and he'd be like, hey, just give me 10% of your business and like, I'll totally help you raise venture funding. Don't, don't do that um, because that's dead weight on your cap table. So you wanna be really careful about who you let on your cap table. Um, you wanna make sure that every equity agreement you sign has vesting. And real quick, vesting is um, your stock accumulates to you over time, right? So if I have a co-founder and then the next day my co-founder leaves for the Bahamas and doesn't want to do any work, if we don't have vesting, then he takes the 50% of the shares, right? So you, you want to have vesting, it protects you and it protects the company too. Um, so have a co-founder agreement and don't give equity unless you have to. Um, investors don't want to see what they call dead weight on your cap table. That means that somebody who has equity in the business but isn't actually adding value to the business. Right, can you guys nod if that makes sense? Okay. All right. And so tip number eight, um, the more you know about the process, the, the better. So again, network with founders, um, try to find a mentor who's been through this before. Again, founders are the best. Um, Noble has a course on launching a startup. Alexis Ohanian leads it. I think it's really good, but you know, your mileage may vary. Um, TechCrunch, uh, in moderation, a lot of people, a lot of like entrepreneurs just spend all their time reading about funding on TechCrunch. Um, you rarely get the real story on from, from TechCrunch. Um, so just be mindful of you know, where you're focusing your time. Again, the more time you can spend talking with customers and having a product that works and that people want, that's, that's the best. Um, there are a lot of great podcasts on fundraising and books and Twitter, obviously, too, I think is, is a wonderful resource. So the best thing you can do is find a Sherpa, somebody who really cares about your success. Um, for me, my Sherpa was this guy, Jan de Ehrlich, who started a bunch of different companies. And um, he has this great tweet, um, which is basically, you know, your startup, what it is, is it's a vehicle for experimentation and learning. Um, so I, I think, you know, he's somebody who I went to with my first term student and said, hey, is this good? Should I sign this? Wow, this is awesome. This like hotshot VC wants to invest in us. Like we're totally going to sign it. And he's the one who would say, hey, no, you should need to talk to three other firms and, you know, you're giving up way too much of your company at this stage, right? That's what you want to find that person who can walk you back from kind of the newbie mistakes. Uh, Matt Munson is another person who's you know, an older founder who's become a CEO coach that's been really helpful to me. So I encourage you to try to find that person. Um, if you can't find that person individually, there's so many people who are sharing great knowledge on Twitter, um, on Knowable, et cetera. Okay, know who you're gonna pitch. Um, I, I keep coming back to this because it's so important. The best way to really understand who is a decision maker at an investment firm is to hear from other founders who have worked with that firm, right? They're gonna say, hey, this partner really knows what they're talking about and they can write a check and say yes. Because oftentimes, you'll maybe you know you've got a product that's out there and an associate will reach out and they'll say oh i'm a decision maker i can totally write you a check uh, and you'll spend a bunch of time with them and then you'll realize oh they're not a decision maker uh, and you sort of built this relationship with a person who might not be able to to help you when you could have been spending time talking with your customers so um keep a spreadsheet with notes of who you talk with at firms the goal the best person to get introduced to at a firm is the person who's the high the, has the most high power at that firm. Um, and usually that's the person who's been there the longest or is a founder of the firm. Okay, somebody asked earlier about, you know, when should I raise? Um, venture capitalists, um, 
at least historically pre-COVID, right, they would go on vacation for, for like the month of August and December um, and basically any holiday, venture capitalists are pretty good about, you know, taking time off. Um, not all of them, there are obviously there are exceptions, but you know, the rule of thumb is generally there's some windows for raising funds. So the beginning of the year is, is a good time. That's when kind of budgets get reset and uh, mental models get reset. Um, and then um, kind of between Labor Day and Thanksgiving is another window. Um, so just, you know, the reality is, is that um, deals will, uh, can linger unless there's some forcing function. So I'll talk more about, you know, other ways to create competitive pressure and constraints. Okay. A lot of people say you want to get a warm intro and what a warm intro means is a founder who knows you and ideally knows you for a really long time, intros you to another investor and says, hey, Lisa is amazing. I've known her for 10 years. She's like outperformed every single person in her peer group. She has this amazing idea that she's passionate about. She wants to be a billionaire. Um, and, uh, you know, if I had the money, I would invest in her. And um, I'm a credible person who's making this introduction because I've made money for you, VC. That's, that's a hot intro. And, the, and an even hotter intro is, hey, um, inside tip, I'm, I'm letting you know as a friend that Lisa is getting a ton of inbound for her new company and you better talk to her fast because somebody else at Sequoia or some other firm that you're competitive with is going to fund her before you do. Okay, so um, <clears throat> VCs, like a lot of them will say, you know, apply on our website. Um, that's kind of a fake door. It's almost, it's, there's just, there's so much noise coming in. They want to see that you have the ability to get attention, right? If you're an entrepreneur, you're going to have to jump through so many hurdles for your business to be successful. If you can't jump through some hurdles like getting a hot or warm introduction, um, that's a sign to a VC that maybe you're not that serious about uh, making it big time. Um, Brad Feld and Mark Seaster have posts on kind of like how to uh, take an intro, et cetera. Um, but real quick, um, <clears throat> have a company email address set up. Don't have like an at Yahoo or at AOL address set up. There's just bias against those. It just feels like you're not with it. Um, reply quickly. If somebody introduces you, just reply quickly. Thank the introducer, move in the BCC, keep it really short and sweet, suggest a few times. I There's conflicting advice on this, like with everything in venture capital, but my personal opinion is I'd avoid sending a deck. Um, ideally a deck is something that you get to walk somebody through, you get to talk them through it, um, but you can have a few kind of bullet points of why uh, you think this VC should want to talk with you. Um, and we can get into more detail about this at the end. Okay, so you've done a whole bunch of pre-prep work. You, um, you, you formed a company, you have built relationships with founders, you're getting warm introductions or hot introductions, and you've decided that you're gonna raise venture capital. You're like, I need, I know that venture capital is the right form of financing for me. Um, I don't wanna bootstrap, I don't want to, um, you know, pay for this on my credit card and I need venture capital to raise. Okay, so then what happens? Okay. Oh, I guess I'm gonna do a little intermission here and check in on you guys. Let's see, chat, thumbs up, tracking. Can you guys let me know in the chat? I'm not gonna even go to the chat because last time it stopped my presentation. Okay, intermission, we did it. Quick break, All right, insider tip number 13. We are more than halfway through this presentation. VC is VC better than you, right? So you're by definition a noob, you're at a structural disadvantage. If you're raising money for your first time from a VC, then you've never done this before. Um, investors, this is what they do for a living. They talk with entrepreneurs, they know the process. So you're at a structural disadvantage. Um, and I can't stress this enough. You wanna have that Sherpa or that founder friend who's gonna help you navigate the process and really help you understand okay, when the VC said this, what did that actually mean? Like, how do I decode what the VC said? Or I got this term sheet, are these good terms? Um, aside from having a Sherpa, this is where having a good startup lawyer can be helpful, right? What you wanna do is, if you get a term sheet, you go to your startup lawyer who, who only focuses on startups and not divorces, and um, you would say, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how founder friendly is this term sheet relative to what you're seeing in the market, right? And you want them to say like, this is a 10, this is super founder friendly. That's what you're going for. Okay, run a process. Uh, nobody likes negotiating. Like it just doesn't, it always feels kind of icky. You don't, you kind of want to just like find that one partner who loves your business, who loves you. And, and that's a really common instinct, but you have a responsibility to yourself and to your business to maximize the um, outcome for yourself. So 
what you, the best way to do this is to run a competitive process. And this is basically the market-based solution to uh, problem number, insider tip number 13, which is VCs VC better than you. So the way to get around this is to talk to multiple VCs at once. Um, how do you do that? Well, you basically, you get those intros around the same time from your founder friends, right? And they're saying, hey, Lisa's, like she's building the next Facebook. Her product is, you know, growing week over week, 10%. Um, and ideally, you know, you're getting interest to in multiple firms and you're doing that around the same time. You then go and say, when you reply to that warm intro, you would say, um, Hey, you know, we're taking meetings starting next week. Um, would love to find a time with you. Um, and that way you basically want to line everyone up around, you want to be having those initial conversations around the same time so that you aren't giving anybody an edge that no one is getting more information than any other partner. Um, so that there's an even playing field and that ideally one or multiple of them will give you a term sheet um, in the near term. So you're creating that competitive pressure. There's sort of this old adage in VC or, or at least that I've heard is that basically people invest for two reasons, fear or greed. So they're afraid that somebody else is going to invest in you before they can or greed. They just see so clearly that you are going to be successful that they're going to write you that check. Having both, that's the best. So create a deadline, create competitive pressure. Otherwise, VCs will just keep asking you for more information. Okay. <clears throat> um, this one's pretty self-explanatory. A lot of investors are uh, secondary investors. They don't lead a round. So this isn't necessarily, I'm not talking about angel investing, which is its own, own world. Um, but if you're raising a institutional round of capital, which is usually above a million bucks, um, you're going to want to find the one person who's going to take about half of the round, right? So if you're saying, hey, I'm raising $3 million, a lead investor is going to invest at least one and a half million dollars. Focus your energy on talking with lead investors first because follow-on investors, they can't lead your round. You can have a whole bunch of people who are, who are interested, but they can't put your round together. So um, ask a question that you want to ask every investor who you talk with is, do you lead? Do you lead rounds? Um, secondary investors, their kind of attitude is, Oh, I'd love to invest once I know that someone else wants to invest in you, right? That's not a lead investor. Okay. When you do a pitch, my recommendation is record it and record it's particularly the audio because if you watch a video of yourself, you're going to just be looking at your visual cues and you want to actually hear where you sound unconfident or nervous or kind of rambling. So record your pitch, listen to your audio. You'll probably, everyone feels kind of cringy when they listen to their own voice. You should do it. It's really, really powerful and insightful. Okay. This is a pre-COVID recommendation, but when you go and you in person to pitch, almost always an executive assistant will say, hey, do you want some water? Um, what do you guys think? Should you say yes or no? Okay, yeah, I, I guess I wrote it in the title. I think you should accept the water. Okay, I, and, and this is a small one. This might feel like a, like a small, weird insider tip, but it's sort of about an attitude, right? Like you deserve to be here. You are an entrepreneur, you're building a business. You're basically, the attitude that you have to have when you're raising capital is, I'm building a rocket ship to take us off of this COVID ridden, you know, plague planet. And you're lucky if you get a seat on my rocket ship, right? So like, yes, thank you for the water. You deserve to be here. If somebody offers you something, accept it. Um, and also just tactically, it's good to have a cup of water to take a sip while you are talking. Uh, your mouth might get dry. You might need a minute to think about something. So just have a prop, uh, even on you know, Zoom-like presentations, it's good to have a cup of water and catch your breath. It shows too that you're in control, which is what you want to demonstrate to a venture capitalist who's gonna give you hopefully millions of dollars. Okay, uh, the COVID edition of this is kind of like every pitch, somebody's gonna be like, how's it going, right? Like it just is this thing that people ask. So most people just say like, great or good. Um, my recognition is have, have a more detailed answer to that to show that you've got momentum, right? So you'd say like, great, we just signed a new customer this morning. I'm super excited about this person or great, you know, TechCrunch reporter just reached out and they're gonna write a story about us. What you wanna do is just going back to that fear and greed thing, you wanna demonstrate, hey, I am building this business and it is taking off with or without you, right? That's the, that's the basic message that you want to convey to a venture capitalist. I think it's best to start your pitch with a big vision, right? A lot of people, what they'll do is they'll focus on what they've done today. They're like, hey, we just built this like, 
you know, prototype and a uh, hundred people are using it. And my net promoter score is really, really good for this hundred people. And they get so caught up in what they've done so far that they leave out. Here's how we're building the next Facebook, right? Like everyone sees the world this way, but we're actually, we're going to build this thing, right? So um, they want to hear that big story because again, they're unicorn hunting, right? They want to believe that you're in this to build a big business. Um, <clears throat> Storytelling is a skill. I recommend you practice it. You're going to get better the more you do it. Um, and in your pitch, the goal is to be optimistic, but not full of shit, right? Like don't, don't, there's like a, there is a fine line. So um, you're going to find that, ask your friends when you do practice pitches, you're going to, you're going to hear like, oh, I thought you were kind of, if you're like, hey, we're going to be the next Google in one year. I, I don't buy that. And then now you've lost credibility, right? But if you say, hey, look, for me, I'll give you guys an example. So I, I built Millable and um, you know, got called into Andreessen Horowitz to, to give the pitch. And um, one of my lines was, look, everyone thinks that no one will pay for audio, right? Because radio has historically been free. <clears throat> so therefore no one will ever pay for audio. But the reality is that people said the exact same thing about television, right? Television used to be totally ad supported. And now we have companies like Amazon and Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus, et cetera, that are multi-billion dollar companies because they create premium video content, right? And so we think the same thing will happen with audio. So uh, you, you want to kind of have that big vision of, okay, here's how we're gonna be this big company um, at, uh, at the beginning of your pitch. Um, okay, you're gonna get rejected. Like you're just gonna get no's because you're going and you're talking to multiple firms. Uh, the likelihood that every single one of them is going to say yes just is low. And that's totally okay. You just keep going and you only need one yes. Like this is, you just need to find that one person who believes in you and your vision for the future and ideally who you like as well, right? So if you get a yes from somebody that you don't like, it's not worth it. And we can talk more about that. But um, again, it's super normal to get rejected. The best thing you can do though is learn, right? So each rejection just ask them, just be like, hey, can you put on your friend hat and just tell me what would have what would have to have been different for you to have wanted to say yes? And the reality is, is that sometimes that almost always it's an emotional reaction. Like there's just something just didn't click for, for the investor and, and you, um, but there might be some intellectual nuggets that you can, you can decide which ones to take. So you don't have to believe every single reason for rejection, um, but you do want to get feedback, right? Because again, going back to what uh, Yonda said earlier, you're, you're basically on a vehicle for learning. Okay. So, and, and once you get that feedback, you can iterate your pitch. You're not going to have all of your meetings in one week, hopefully. Um, a, a, you know, common advice is pitch the firms that you're kind of less excited about initially, um, because that gives you an opportunity to go do a dry run, get your ums and ahs out of your pitch and, you know, figure out where you stumble, et cetera. So uh, get some reps in. Another great way to do this is just pitch friends. Um, there are groups where you can do uh, um, pitch practice, et cetera. Um, and then look, the reality too is that different investors want different things. So this is going back to why you want to have founder friends because founder friends will tell you, I know this investor is super interested in the future of audio, right? Like they, they just believe that audio is this new emerging platform. And so you should talk with them versus going and talking to an investor who only invests in uh, I don't know, bio health stuff, that wouldn't be a good fit for me, right? So find the investors who you think are gonna be likely to be qualified. All right, um, fundraising and, and business building is a very consuming process. A lot of people confuse their identity with their startup's, pro startups identity. Don't do it. Um, Self-care shows confidence, right? This really is a triathlon. Like you are building this, if, if you're successful, you will be spending at least a decade with this business, right? So. Um, take care of yourself, um, surround yourself with, with friends, find, again, find friends who have been through the process who can, who can empathize and, uh, you know, make sure that you're um, going about things the right way. All right, <clears throat> so you've listened to Warren's advice, you, uh, you successfully got your, your term sheets, and now it's your turn to diligence your investors. So, so far, a lot of first-time investor or first-time founders, they have this idea of investors as being super knowledgeable and they're very respectful. And um, you know, investors are really good at sounding smart. Many of them are very, very smart and, and they, they can give you good feedback. Um, but you need to also remember that you have value, right? And that you are deciding who you want to work with just as much as they're deciding who they want to work with. So um, really important is to diligence your investors. Um, it's, you basically can't divorce your investor. 
Um, <clears throat> so what I recommend is um, ask your investor for references and go and talk with the people who they didn't, who they funded, but did not list as references. Because pretty much every investor is going to be cool when things are going well. Um, but not all investors are, are great to work with if things are not going well. And pretty much every startup runs into some patch, even the successful ones, runs into patches where things are not going well. So you want to find, you want to make sure that you're working with an investor who is founder friendly, who's aligned with your vision, who you think is going to be supportive through thick and thin. Okay, we're so close. Insider tip number 23, get the money, right? That's what, you're, you're talking with VCs because you want their money. I remember when I was uh, starting out as an entrepreneur, I was like, wow, do they just like a venture capital firm, do they send you all the money? Like, do you get millions of dollars wired to your account? The answer is yes, right? They, they, they will wire the money to your company bank account, um, but you were in fundraising mode until that money wires, right? So even as you're going, like, don't get distracted with the process, keep building your business, right? Because if, if you have an investor is like, wow, Lisa is just like only hasn't done anything over the one month of legal diligence and there's been no traction and no progress, they can, they can decide maybe I don't want to invest in this person, right? So keep your eyes on the prize, which is product market fit, solving problems at scale and keeping customers happy. Um, cash in the bank, you got it, pat yourself on the back. It is, you know, it's not easy to do, but it's really just the beginning. It's not a goal in itself. I'm going to repeat it. Raising venture capital is not a goal in itself that you should have. It's a means to an end. Okay. So what you should be doing is focusing on the fundamentals. Um, best time to raise when you don't need to. The, the stronger your business is, the more leverage you will have in the fundraising process, the easier it will be to raise follow-on financing, and the happier you will be because you have a business that is hopefully working, right? Um, so again, uh, raising money is the beginning, not the end. Um, and tip number five is basically talk with your customers, like check out, keep your eye on the dashboard of uh, like customer happiness or member happiness because investor inbound is not product market fit. And you, if you raise a round of financing, especially from a big firm, lots of other investors will email you and be like, I love what you're doing. That's so awesome, Lisa. You know, wow, your pretzel business is, is amazing. Um, but that it's really easy to confuse that with actually building something that, that people want. So uh, keep your eyes on the prize and, and on your customers. All right, that's the end of the presentation for right now. Let me stop the share and answer questions. Okay. All right, I'm gonna to try to answer as many questions as possible. Feel free to add more. Looking through the comments. All right, so Zach asked, I don't need funding right now, but I've heard it's good to build a network up before you go to raise. How is the best way to go about doing this? So accelerators, I talked about, I think accelerators are really valuable. Um, Knowable has a course called Launch a Startup um, and we have a Slack community. Um, I think that one is, is, you know, is a good way to meet other founders, especially first time founders. Um, Twitter is the other one, right? Follow people who you respect, try to build a relationship with them online, even if you're not in the same geography as them. Um, all right. When am I coming to Miami to visit Alexis? No plans. Does equity crowdfunding hurt your chance of raising VC in the future? Okay, so equity crowdfunding, um, I don't, I'm not an expert in this one, so I don't, I'm kind of wary to opine on it. I think that it's, it's pretty interesting from a philosophical standpoint. The idea that you can get more people invested in your company is, is really cool. Um, so I think it's definitely worth, worth looking into and exploring. I just don't know the latest on it. I think the benefits of having a venture capital firm, ideally you're finding a partner who really knows your business, who's really excited about your vision and can be really helpful. Um, the idea, you know, so you have more dispersion of, of uh, involvement if you're doing equity crowdfunding versus, you know, taking money from one firm and one partner or a few firms and a few partners. Um, okay, this one from, I got a question from Tom. Hey, Warren, really enjoying this. Could you tell me if any UK companies have success with US VCs? So there, there are certainly some firms that are based in the US that are investing internationally. This is the kind of thing where, again, like make friends with founders who are in the UK and go ask them how they got funded, right? Um, and unfortunately, there just isn't, VCs kind of, it's not always clear exactly where they're investing or what they're investing in. So you want to talk with the founders, they're going to know best. Um, 
Okay, this one question from Zakir, should you allocate from beginning certain percentage, like 20% for fundraising? Kind of the rule of thumb is you're giving up about 20% of your company every round. And it's gonna vary based on how much leverage you have. You know, the, the stronger you are, the less capital you need, or the less you need capital rather, the better position you're in to give up less equity in your business. Um, but kind of a, a standard rule of thumb is 20% is, uh, is common. And you're also gonna run into things like creating an option pool. Um, so you're able to give employees options that can be exercised for equity in your business uh, that does not dilute the investor. So that's kind of a, another thing to think about. And that's a term that you're gonna wanna talk about with your hopefully startup proficient non-divorce attorney. Um, Equity crowdfunding is also better for D to C physical goods versus services. Yeah, so I think equity crowdfunding again is interesting because you might have people who are investing in your business that are not unicorn hunters, right? They're they're happy if you can get a two x or a three x return. They just love your product, um, and they're going to buy your whatever it is shoe shoes, um, you know, because they're investors. Um, all right, this one from Matt. Any tips on moving from bootstrapped to venture backed? I'm getting to a place where I have good traction plus great reviews. Uh, but the growth rates aren't as good as they would be with venture dollars, bigger team, et cetera. Okay. A lot of people think that the more people you have, the faster you will grow. Um, I actually think that's not always true. The more people you have, the more time you spend managing people rather than managing your business. So uh, I think, you know, you want to be really, you want to be really clear about why your growth rates are not increasing. Um, and the best thing you can do is, is talk with customers. Um, but look, there are certain businesses where you just need capital to grow quickly. Um, and, and I think you want to have a really clear, clear pitch to a venture investor of here's why this business needs venture funding to grow, right? We're going to be the next Facebook. We're going to lose money for years, um, but we're going to build up this huge network. And the, the longer we're in business, the stronger we get, um, that kind of thing. Okay, so this question is from... From Phil, how does the fundraising process differ for a venture in deep tech? So I, I don't know deep tech as well as I know consumer tech, um, but with deep tech, you know, it's, they're going to spend a lot more time actually understanding, do you have IP that is really special? Um, so just be prepared. And again, to sound super repetitive, talk to founders who have raised money for deep tech companies and figure out what their process is like. Okay, this one from John, how important is geography post COVID? Um, I think it's less important, certainly. Like it, there is, there definitely has been this equalization where you can pitch a venture capitalist over Zoom. You can build a relationship over Zoom. But at the end of the day, it's still humans on the other side of the screen, right? And they, they want to know that you know somebody who knows them. Like they're going to want to see, do we have co connections in common on LinkedIn? Like, how do I really trust this person? So I think, I still think that tech hubs are, will have some competitive advantage. But like with everything, there are exceptions to the rule, right? So you can be in Antarctica in your cabin and, and build a scalable business. Um, you're just going to want to have, you're going to want to dial up the levers of some of the other things like more traction, more clear success uh, to counterbalance the, the lack of um, personal, <coughs> personal connection. Okay, this one's from Elizabeth. Do I recommend any books? or YouTube videos to build your acumen on all things venture capital. Um, so I think follow Paul Graham on Twitter, follow uh, Gary Tan on Twitter, follow Alexis on Twitter. Um, welcome to follow me on Twitter. Um, Knowable has a startup course that Alexis Ohanian, he's the founder of Reddit, leads. Um, you can take that course for $9. I think it's really good. Um, I think there's certainly podcasts on venture capital, um, Jason Ye. Has, has a podcast called The Funded, um, where he talks to, to founders who have gone through the fundraising process. Um, A16Z has a great podcast. Uh, How I Built This by Guy Raz is good founder stories. I, I wouldn't really count on it to be super educational, right? You're getting the glossed over kind of end of the road story. Um, the, best, the, the best resource is founders who are one or two steps ahead of you, because they're going to know, here are the latest market terms. Here's like which investors are currently active, et cetera. <clears throat> um, in regards to raising your first VC round, what are the biggest mistakes you see and or hear about from first time entrepreneurs? So this is Manji. Um, 
I think the biggest, like the biggest mistake that's still surprising to me is a lot of people try to raise VC when they don't have a, a business that has the potential to be a really big business. So they're like, spend a bunch of time trying to meet VCs. And they're like, hey, I've got this, you know, um, consulting services business. I'm like, I want to raise venture capital for it. Like that, that it, it lacks scalability. And if you don't have, and it's possible that you can go from a bootstrap kind of niche business to a really big business. But if you don't have some clear vision of how you're going to do that, then I think you're, you're kind of wasting your time. <clears throat> I think also a big common mistake is people confuse the goal, right? A lot of people think, I want to raise venture capital to raise venture capital. And I think really the goal is raise venture capital because you need it, you believe you need it to build the successful business that you truly yourself want to build. Um, there are a ton of other first time mistakes. I, you know, I, I alluded to a lot of them. I think uh, not having a vesting agreement with a co-founder can be really hurtful. Um, yeah, so let's see. Uh, this one is a personal question. I'm gonna skip over this one, Jagnetta. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounced your, your name incorrectly. Um, uh, but maybe we'll come back to it. Drew, can you share more about how VCs diligence founders? What does the vetting process look like? Does that differ between technical versus non-technical founders? Yeah, VCs will ask you for references um, when they're when they've decided to invest. Right? They'll be like, "We love this person. We love your business. We want to send you millions of dollars. We need to talk to some other people who know you." Um, so they'll ask you for references. They might do the same thing that I recommended you do to them, which is talk to people who you didn't list as references. Right? Um, so. You know, the best way to be perceived as trustworthy is to be a trustworthy person. So keep that in mind. This is, you know, if you, if you want to raise VC, it's you're playing a long game and your reputation really matters. Um, <clears throat> this question is from Tom again. Is there a team size which is too small to be acceptable to a VC? Uh, honestly, no. I mean, I think I think there is a bias towards having at least two co-founders, because if you can't convince at least one other person to join you, uh, it's not a good sign. Um, so I think historically there's been a bias towards that. Certainly there are people who have created big businesses as solo founders. Um, my bias is to find a co-founder because you're going to want somebody who has complementary skills who can take on some of the stuff that you can't. So, you know, maybe you're the salesperson and you have a co-founder who's technical or vice versa. Um, I think that's kind of a common uh, path, but you don't, you don't need to have really more than two people to, to be able to raise funding, especially if you have a product built that is working, right? That's the best sign. If you know the fewer people you have, the more traction you have, the less costs you have, that's all going to be attractive to a venture capital investor. <clears throat> this one is from, from Manji. Um, thank you. You love Knowable and you took two courses, the, the startup one and the podcast one. You're curious to hear about what uh, the exciting next steps are for us. So um, we are Knowable as a startup. I mentioned we're audio first. Uh, we've got courses like this guy, Alexis, the co-founder of Reddit, did this course on startups. And um, we are, basically, we looked at the e-learning space and it's a trillion dollar industry and every player is focused on video and we saw this blue ocean around audio. And I, and you know, from a product, from a founder market fit perspective, a founder product market, founder product perspective, um, I've listened to audiobooks since I was a teenager. I love audiobooks, right? Like I've, I've always, found that time of having a quality audio companion when you know moving through the world to be really valuable. So um, we, you know, I saw an opportunity to take audiobooks to the next level to bring the best of podcasts and e-learning into the experience. And so we're just continuing on that and um, still exploring different ways that we can help people learn uh, more effectively and efficiently. And so that's why I'm doing this teaching and hopefully getting feedback from you guys too of what works and what doesn't. <clears throat> um, this one's from Drew for pre-seed seed. Do you need to have a clear CEO amongst co-founders? Can you defer this? Thoughts on co-CEOs? Yeah, really good question, Drew. Um, <clears throat> I, I think you should just pick a CEO because it's it's a landmine. It's just a landmine. If you don't if you don't figure it out now, it, it's gonna blow up. There's gonna be egos. It, you want to have a really clear co-founder agreement. And often, if you can't decide who the CEO should be. The concern is that you don't have complementary skills and you have a lot of overlap. And when you've got two people in the kitchen who have the exact same skill set and are trying to cook the same meal, it gets crowded super fast. So my recommendation is find the CEO. And usually the CEO is the person who is the best storyteller, the best fundraiser, the person who's going to hold the vision, right? Who's going to think about 
okay, not just how we solve problems today, but how this thing grows to be a scalable business. Um, the, the best teams are, there's somebody who's a great builder and there's somebody who's a great salesperson. And usually the salesperson ends up being the CEO because they're more public facing. So um, you can, there are certainly companies that have had successful outcomes with co-CEOs though. So like with everything, uh, there are exceptions, um, but generally, have clear delineation, delineation of who's doing what, who's responsible for what, who's got the domain expertise in what area so that you're not bumping into, into each other all the time. Um, <clears throat> all right, any tips on how to create a realistic, this one's from Elizabeth, any tips on how to create a realistic financial model? I find lots of founders make extremely optimistic business models that are too idealistic. Uh, I, I, most investors, they just wanna see that you can model something they're not really looking at your model and being like, this is for sure gonna work, right? They, they wanna know that you can think though in a way of dollars and cents and revenue and costs and profit. Um, so it's really more, I think when you're making a model for, especially for the early stage, it's more an exercise in demonstrating that you can figure stuff out than an exercise and this is for sure how the business is gonna develop because you don't know, right? Like going back to the quote from Yonda in the presentation, you're you're learning, like your job is to learn as fast as possible. So the best way to do that is build something, put it out there, or maybe even, I would even say like, put it out there, build it in public and like find out if anybody cares. And that's gonna inform your inputs of how much will people pay for this? How much does it cost to acquire a customer? You just often don't know in advance. So I, I think worrying, worrying a whole bunch about your financial model isn't where you should be worried. Spend time focusing on making a product that people want. Um, Phil, you're asking about the best place to find co-founders. Um, Phil, you, I know you, you and I have talked because you took the startup course and um, we, we connected in the Slack community for, for that startup course. And I know that you've got a really cool idea and you're technical. I think um, if you have technical skills, you should have a pretty easy time finding a co-founder because a lot of people who are in business school want to start a company, but they lack the technical skills. So my recommendation to you is to actually go and um, uh, I, would, I would build your idea in public, like we talked about this, and then attract people to, to you, right? And be like, hey, I'm building this thing. Does anyone, I'm looking for a sales driven co-founder. Um, and you kind of treat it like dating and you spend a lot of time with different people and uh, you, you find the person who you really believe you have complementary skills with, but very, very strong overlap and core values. And I think, uh, you know, the best co-founders are usually a, usually at a similar life stage. Like you kind of are in the same boat because <clears throat> if one person is starting a family and the other person is just coming out of school, there's going to be a resentment of like who's spending more time, et cetera. So um, ideally you're finding somebody at a similar life stage too, but strong overlap and core values. Um, how do we join the Slack community? If you take the launch a startup course and sign up for it, you'll get a link to the uh, Slack community. What are your thoughts on seeking VC for a pivot? How can we show that it's a valid pivot? So pivots happen all the time. I've done so many pivots. I can't even count them. Um, uh, it's okay. It's part of the process of, of learning and iterating on, on your idea. Um, it, the same rules apply though for raising venture capital, right? If you, you want to have, you want to de-risk the riskiest components of an investor's investment for them. So show that you have a credible team, a dedicated team, that's interested in building, building a highly scalable business. Ideally, you've got uh, a product that people want and is growing really quickly. Um, <clears throat> okay, how do founders raise millions of dollars for an idea stage? I never understand how this happens. All right, I'm glad you asked this. So Quibi raised a billion dollars before they had anything, right? And Magic Leap raised a billion dollars before they had anything. So. There are some people who are able to do this. Most people are not able to do this. The reason Jeffrey Katzenberg was able to raise a billion dollars for Quibi was because he had built DreamWorks, which was a pioneering company. Like he had this long track record of success. So investors were willing to take a higher risk. They were willing because, because he had such high scores as a founder, a previous founder or leader at least, um, they were willing to tolerate lower de-risking on the, uh, you know, the product market fit slider. Um, if you're not Jeffrey Katzenberg, if you're a first time founder, you're, you're probably not, you're gonna have a much harder time raising pre-funding. And I would 
I think going back to this question of what do a lot of first time founders, what are some of the common mistakes? A lot of people think I need to raise money in order to get my idea off the ground. And I think that's not true. I think uh, most ideas you can do, you can have a job and moonlight um, for some for some of ideas, but it, it's true. Like there are certainly, you know, uh, for Knowable, we raised money pre-launch, but that's because we had a track record. We saw an opportunity in a big space. Um, so it, it really depends um, how much you can de-risk on other areas if you're if you're pre-launch. Okay, <clears throat> um, I'm gonna answer a couple more questions. Uh, thoughts on doing more than one venture at once, fatal or possible? I think it's fine to have multiple ideas running in parallel uh, because you're gonna you want to learn fast. So it's really a personal decision for you whether or not you can do it. But I think that you. It's okay to, to test multiple things. Um, it's becoming easier and easier to, to test ideas out. <clears throat> okay, this one is from Manji. How to differentiate good and bad VCs? What are red flags and warnings that we should look out for VCs? So um, not every VC is right for every business. So it's subjective to some degree, right? Like a great biotech investor isn't gonna be a great consumer investor. Their network and expertise just isn't in your area. So you first and foremost, you wanna find the investor that's right for you, <clears throat> then you definitely want to go and do diligence on them before you, before you um, sell them equity, right? So, what, what I recommended before is get a list of references, talk with those references, but also talk with people who took money from that investor but weren't listed as references, um, because they might have had a really bad experience, and you you want to know that, and their experience might have been unique and the founder might've been really bad, but like you, you wanna gather as much data as you can <clears throat> on people before you, uh, before you sign up. Um, David, can I unmute you and see if you have any other questions that I might've missed that you, wanna, you want me to cover? Uh, yeah, there's a few more uh, by, the, by the audience. Um, most VCs say that team is their number one consideration. What does that mean? What does that mean combined? Uh, does that mean that the combined resume is an experience of the team or does it mean the personality and affect of the team? Right. <clears throat> um, so um, team, I think is there's sort of like two big, big buckets that investors look at team and market. So this goes back to even you know, the market size is if I'm building um, a super specialized business and the market is really small, that's just like an automatic ding, right? If I'm like the total addressable market is $20 million, that's a, that's a definite no. Team is this really subjective thing. Um, it's harder to evaluate, but this is where, you know, some of these tips can be so useful, right? Like being, showing poise, having a network of founders, having ability to jump through hurdles, th those all help you de-risk as, as an entrepreneur. Um, grit is a really important component of, of great founders. It's probably one of the most unifying characteristics across all founders. Um, I think founders come in all shapes and forms, but almost all of them have, have, uh, have grit. So, um, and having a proven track record too, right? Like if you can point to a past success, that's really helpful. Somebody asked me earlier, I have in my Twitter bio that I'm a, an alum of eviction. So I'm a first generation um, American and my parents hit like severe financial distress when I was 12 years old. And I ended up seeing like an eviction notice on my door. And I ended up living with another family for my teenage years and going through high school. And I, I will sometimes like in certain instances share that when I was a first time founder, I would share that story as an example of like, I know how to overcome stuff and see problems as opportunities too. So even if you haven't had a, a, like a super strong business track record, showing some signs of grit and perseverance can help you as an entrepreneur. Um, okay, I'm, my throat is becoming parched. So I'm gonna answer a few more questions and then and then uh, can answer more over text if you guys wanna email me too. Um, okay, this one's from Roman. I'm a full stack experienced founder. What if I decide to go as a solo founder? How much friction does it create in the fundraising process? Um, It really depends. I, I don't know. I've never tried to raise money as a solo founder, so I can't say for sure. But the best thing you can do is have great fundamentals, right? If you 
you have some product that's working and people are, it's growing super fast and you've got a big vision, you can raise money as a solo founder, right? It might be a little harder, but you, you know, if you've got credibility and from past ventures and people believe that you can work well with others, then I don't see why you, you shouldn't be able to raise. All right, David, any, any strong last ones? Um, tips on pitching Alexis Ohanian. Um, how did you go about pitching him? Yeah, so um, Alexis invested in, in a company that my co-founder Alex and I built called Knowable. And we had we built an MVP of this product. It was a super simple video upload tool. And we uh, did- You mean I, Vidme. You Vidme, said Knowable. Sorry, sorry yeah, uh, they're blurring together. Um, we, we built this product called Vidme and uh, it was a super simple way to share a video in 2014. And it's hard to remember now, but back then it was actually hard to send a video over even SMS, right? So we, we created this, this super simple way to do it. We put it out there and people immediately started using it and sharing it because video is inherently viral. And we were growing at least 10% week over week, right? And so remember going back to this, like find founder friends, find Sherpas? Well, that guy who, you know, I really look up to Yonda, who's a, who's a seasoned founder, he said, whoa, this thing is working, right? Like you have early signs of product market fit. Um, let me introduce you to Alexis, who I know and who's an investor in my company and, um, and you guys can pitch him. And I was super excited because I had read Alexis's book. I really, you know, I, loved, I admired, read it. I admired what he built. And, and I remember we pitched him over Google Hangouts. I think we were in LA and he was an SF. And we basically, what we did was we showed him our growth chart. And that was like, so convincing, right? It was, hey, and, and we had, Alex and I had, you know, worked at a previous business together before. So we already had some track record, but like we had this hot intro from, from somebody that Yonda trusted and we had week over week growth and we had a big, big vision. So we checked all those boxes and Alexis, and if you can work with him, I highly, highly recommend him. Like he is a former founder. And so he will understand many of the challenges of starting a company. Um, and I think many of the best investors are former founders. Um, but he, you know, I remember he tweeted out like, whoa, just used, he used the product and he tweeted it out. And that actually helped us create even more momentum in our fundraising process because it was like other investors saw that Alexis was interested. And so this helped us and we were happy to work with Alexis and, and still are today. Um, again, highly recommend if you can work with him that you work with him. Um, I'm going to answer, I'm going to answer this one last question and then, and then we're going to uh, pause. So how do you balance building your product, which is finding product market fit and raising external capital? Super, super hard. The less time you spend raising capital, the better. Like it just is the more time you can spend on your product and talking with customers and looking at your data. That's, that's gold. Like the fundraising investors, a lot of investors are really smart, but none of them are going to know your business as well as you are and care about it as much as you are. So minimize your time fundraising. I wouldn't, I minimize time like trying to network with investors and maximize your time talking with other founders because they will they will be able to share what worked for them. And, and I think a bit of advice to you, when you ask someone for advice, don't really ask them what you think, what they think you should do, ask them what they did. Like gather data of what worked and what didn't work for them. And that's gonna allow you to, to get the most value from that conversation. Um, all right, David, anything, any last one? I think, can we end on that? Uh, yeah, we can end so on that. So many good questions. I, I do wanna, okay, last, last one. Um, how do I manage time as a CEO? Um, I calendar everything. I, one of the best career decisions I've made uh, is I recently hired an executive coach. Um, I always thought that executive coaching was like a sign of weakness and meant that I wasn't, didn't know what I was doing. And I completely 180'd on that. I think working with a coach is, is so wise and I highly recommend it if you, if you can do it. And, um, and I realized that not everyone can afford it. Um, but you know, one thing that I learned from executive coaching is just calendar every single thing. So like I calendar when I'm sleeping and, and I really, really try to not multitask. So I think multitasking hurts your energy and focus and time and the quality of your work. So another trick I do is um, when I'm, off work and like having dinner, I give my phone uh, to my wife and I say like, hide this from me because then I don't have to spend any willpower fighting the urge to go check work and I can just be present. And studies have shown, Harvard Business Review did this big study that showed that people who can do focused work and focused rest 
they're the most effective. So um, I don't think that you should work 100 hours a week. I think there's really fast diminishing marginal returns of, of time. A lot of people who claim to work 100 hour weeks are you know, spending half of it just reading TechCrunch. Um, I think do focused work and, and do focused rest um, and you'll, you'll go far. And remember, it's, it's a triathlon, right? Like you're trying to build, your goal here is to build a company for the long run. Um, so you got to take care of yourself too. All right, I'm gonna end on that note. Thank you everyone. Sorry for all the technical difficulties. Thank you to everyone who stuck around and asked great questions. Um, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at WWShafe. Um, if you haven't already, um, I encourage you to check out Knowable. We've got the course that Alexis leads called Launch a Startup. You can take it for nine bucks um, and join the Slack community and meet other founders. Um, and I'd love to hear from you too, if you have feedback for me, like what else, what do you wanna know? What did I miss? Um, feel free to email me. I'm warren at knowable.fyi or reach out to me on Twitter. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a good MLK day, good Monday, and, and best of luck on your venture. And um, if, you, if you're going to raise venture capital, um, let me know um, how it goes. And, and hopefully this was helpful to you. And if you decide not to raise venture capital, I think that's great too. Um, you know, really the end goal for you is build a company that you're proud of, that makes you happy, um, and that solves problems for other people too.